Section 4 of Reflections on the Revolution in France. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reflections on the Revolution in France and on the proceedings in certain societies in London relative to that event in a letter intended to have been sent to a gentleman in Paris, 1790, by Edmund Burke. Section 4 you might if you pleased have profited of our example and have given to your recovered freedom a correspondent dignity your privileges though discontinued were not lost to memory your constitution it is true whilst you were out of possession suffered waste and dilapidation but you possessed in some parts the walls and in all the foundations of a noble and venerable castle you might have repaired those walls you might have built on those old foundations. Your constitution was suspended before it was perfected, but you had the elements of a constitution very nearly as good as could be wished. In your old states you possessed that variety of parts corresponding with the various descriptions of which your community was happily composed. You had all that combination and all that opposition of interests. You had that action and counteraction which, in the natural and in the political world, from the reciprocal struggle of discordant powers, draws out the harmony of the universe. These opposed and conflicting interests, which you considered as so great a blemish in your old, and in our present constitution, interpose a salutary check to all precipitate resolutions. They render deliberation a matter not of choice, but of necessity. They make all change a subject of compromise, which naturally begets moderation. They produce temperaments, preventing the sole evil of harsh, crude, unqualified reformations, and rendering all the headlong exertions of arbitrary power, in the few or in the many, forever impracticable. Through that diversity of members and interests, general liberty had as many securities as there were separate views in the several orders whilst by pressing down the whole by the weight of a real monarchy the separate parts would have been prevented from warping and starting from their allotted places you had all these advantages in your ancient states but you chose to act as if you had never been moulded into civil society and had everything to begin anew you began ill because you began by despising everything that belonged to you you set up your trade without a capital if the last generations of your country appeared without much luster in your eyes, you might have passed them by and derived your claims from a more early race of ancestors. Under a pious predilection for those ancestors, your imaginations would have realized in them a standard of virtue and wisdom beyond the vulgar practice of the hour, and you would have risen with the example to whose imitation you aspired. Respecting your forefathers, you would have been taught to respect yourselves. You would not have chosen to consider the French as a people of yesterday, as a nation of low-born, servile wretches, until the emancipating year of 1789. In order to furnish, at the expense of your honor, an excuse to your apologists here for several enormities of yours, you would not have been content to be represented as a gang of maroon slaves suddenly broke loose from the house of bondage and therefore to be pardoned for your abuse of the liberty to which you were not accustomed and were ill-fitted would it not my worthy friend have been wiser to have you thought what i for one always thought you a generous and gallant nation long misled to your disadvantage by your high and romantic sentiments of fidelity honor and loyalty that events had been unfavorable to you but that you were not enslaved through any illiberal or servile disposition, that, in your most devoted submission, you were actuated by a principle of public spirit, and that it was your country you worshipped, in the person of your king. Had you made it to be understood, that in the delusion of this amiable error, you had gone further than your wise ancestors, that you were resolved to resume your ancient privileges, whilst you preserved the spirit of your ancient and your recent loyalty and honor, or if diffident of yourselves, and not clearly discerning the almost obliterated constitution of your ancestors, you had looked to your neighbors in this land, 
who had kept alive the ancient principles and models of the old common law of europe meliorated and adapted to its present state by following wise examples you would have given new examples of wisdom to the world you would have rendered the cause of liberty venerable in the eyes of every worthy mind in every nation you would have shamed despotism from the earth by showing that freedom was not only reconcilable but as when well disciplined it is auxiliary to law you would have had an unoppressive but a productive revenue you would have had a flourishing commerce to feed it you would have had a free constitution a potent monarchy a disciplined army a reformed and venerated clergy a mitigated but spirited nobility to lead your virtue not to overlay it you would have had a liberal order of commons to emulate and to recruit that nobility you would have had a protected satisfied laborious and obedient people taught to seek and to recognize the happiness that is to be found by virtue in all conditions in which consists the true moral equality of mankind and not in that monstrous fiction which by inspiring false ideas and vain expectations into men destined to travel in the obscure walk of laborious life serves only to aggravate and embitter that real inequality which it never can remove and which the order of civil life establishes as much for the benefit of those whom it must leave in a humble state as those whom it is able to exalt to a condition more splendid but not more happy you had a smooth and easy career of felicity and glory laid open to you beyond anything recorded in the history of the world but you have shown that difficulty is good for man compute your gains see what is got by those extravagant and presumptuous speculations which have taught your leaders to despise all their predecessors and all their contemporaries and even to despise themselves until the moment in which they became truly despicable by following those false lights france has bought undisguised calamities at a higher price than any nation has purchased the most unequivocal blessings france has bought poverty by crime france has not sacrificed her virtue to her interest but she has abandoned her interest that she might prostitute her virtue all other nations have begun the fabric of a new government or the reformation of an old by establishing originally or by enforcing with greater exactness some rights or other of religion all other people have laid the foundations of civil freedom in severer manners and a system of a more austere and masculine morality france when she let loose the reins of regal authority doubled the license of a ferocious dissoluteness in manners and of an insolent irreligion in opinions and practices and has extended through all ranks of life as if she were communicating some privilege or laying open some secluded benefit all the unhappy corruptions that usually were the disease of wealth and power this is one of the new principles of equality in france france by the perfidy of her leaders has utterly disgraced the tone of lenient counsel in the cabinets of princes and disarmed it of its most potent topics she has sanctified the dark suspicious maxims of tyrannous distrust and taught kings to tremble at what will hereafter be called the delusive plausibilities of moral politicians sovereigns will consider those who advise them to place an unlimited confidence in their people as subverters of their thrones as traitors who aim at their destruction by leading their easy good nature under specious pretenses to admit combinations of bold and faithless men into a participation of their power this alone if there were nothing else is an irreparable calamity to you and to mankind remember that your parliament of paris told your king that in calling the states together he had nothing to fear but the prodigal excess of their zeal in providing for the support of the throne it is right that these men should hide their heads it is right that they should bear their part in the ruin which their council has brought on their sovereign and their country such sanguine declarations tend to lull authority asleep to encourage it rashly to engage in perilous adventures of untried policy to neglect those provisions preparations and precautions which distinguish benevolence from imbecility and without which no man can answer 
for the salutary effect of any abstract plan of government or of freedom. For want of these, they have seen the medicine of the state corrupted into its poison. They have seen the French rebel against a mild and lawful monarch with more fury, outrage, and insult than ever any people has been known to rise against the most illegal usurper or the most sanguinary tyrant. Their resistance was made to concession. Their revolt was from protection. Their blow was aimed at a hand holding out graces, favors, and immunities. This was unnatural. The rest is in order. They have found their punishment in their success. Laws overturned, tribunals subverted, industry without vigor, commerce expiring, the revenue unpaid, yet the people impoverished, a church pillaged, and a state not relieved. Civil and military anarchy made the constitution of the kingdom. Everything human and divine sacrificed to the idol of public credit, and national bankruptcy the consequence. And, to crown all, the paper securities of new precarious tottering power, the discredited paper securities of impoverished fraud and beggared rapine, held out as a currency for the support of an empire in lieu of the two great recognized species that represent the lasting conventional credit of mankind, which disappeared and hid themselves in the earth from whence they came, when the principle of property, whose creatures and representatives they are, was systematically subverted? Were all these dreadful things necessary? Were they all the inevitable results of the desperate struggle of determined patriots, compelled to wade through blood and tumult to the quiet shore of a tranquil and prosperous liberty? No, nothing like it. The fresh ruins of France, which shock our feelings whenever we can turn our eyes, are not the devastation of civil war. They are the sad but instructive monuments of rash and ignorant counsel in time of profound peace. They are the display of inconsiderate and presumptuous, because unresisted and irresistible authority. The persons who have thus squandered away the precious treasure of their crimes, the persons who have made this prodigal and wild waste of public evils, the last stake reserved for the ultimate ransom of the state, have met in their progress with little or rather with no opposition at all. Their whole march was more like a triumphal procession than the progress of a war. Their pioneers have gone before them, and demolished and laid everything level at their feet. Not one drop of their blood have they shed in the cause of the country they have ruined. They have made no sacrifices to their projects of greater consequence than their shoe-buckles. Whilst they were imprisoning their king, murdering their fellow-citizens, and bathing in tears and plunging in poverty and distress thousands of worthy men and worthy families. Their cruelty has not even been the base result of fear. It has been the effect of their sense of perfect safety in authorizing treasons, robberies, rapes, assassinations, slaughters, and burnings throughout their harassed land. But the cause of all was plain from the beginning. This unforced choice, this fond election of evil, would appear perfectly unaccountable if we did not consider the composition of the National Assembly. I do not mean its formal constitution, which, as it now stands, is exceptionable enough, but the materials of which, in a great measure, it is composed, which is of ten thousand times greater consequence than all the formalities in the world. If we were to know nothing of this assembly, but by its title and function, no colors could paint to the imagination anything more venerable. In that light, the mind of an inquirer, subdued by such an awful image as that of the virtue and wisdom of a whole people, collected into one focus, would pause and hesitate in condemning things even of their very worst aspect. Instead of blamable, they would appear only mysterious. But no name, no power, no function, no artificial institution whatsoever, can make the men of whom any system of authority is composed any other than God and nature and education and their habits of life have made them. Capacities beyond these the people have not to give. Virtue and wisdom may be the objects of their choice, but their choice confers neither the one nor the other on those upon whom they lay their ordaining hands. They have not the engagement of nature, 
they have not the promise of revelation for any such powers after i had read over the list of the persons and descriptions elected into the tier etat nothing which they afterwards did could appear astonishing among them indeed i saw some of known rank some of the shining talents but of any practical experience in the state not one man was to be found the best were only men of theory but whatever the distinguished few may have been it is the substance and mass of the body which constitutes its character and must finally determine its direction in all bodies those who will lead must also in a considerable degree follow they must conform their propositions to the taste talent and disposition of those whom they wish to conduct therefore if an assembly is viciously or feebly composed in a very great part of it nothing but such a supreme degree of virtue as very rarely appears in the world and for that reason cannot enter into calculation will prevent the men of talents disseminated through it from becoming only the expert instruments of absurd projects if what is the more likely event instead of that unusual degree of virtue they should be actuated by sinister ambition any less than meretricious glory then the feeble part of the assembly to whom at first they conform becomes in its turn the dupe and instrument of their designs in this political traffic the leaders will be obliged to bow to the ignorance of their followers and the followers to become subservient to the worst designs of their leaders to secure any degree of sobriety in the propositions made by the leaders in any public assembly they ought to respect in some degree perhaps to fear those whom they conduct to be led any otherwise than blindly the followers must be qualified if not for actors at least for judges they must also be judges of natural weight and authority nothing can secure a steady and moderate conduct in such assemblies but that the body of them should be respectably composed in point of condition in life of permanent property of education and of such habits as enlarge and liberalize the understanding in the calling of the states general of france the first thing that struck me was a great departure from the ancient course i found the representation for the third estate composed of six hundred persons they were equal in number to the representatives of both the other orders if the orders were to act separately the number would not beyond the consideration of the expense be of much moment but when it became apparent that the three orders were to be melted down into one the policy and necessary effect of this numerous representation became obvious a very small desertion from either of the other two orders must throw the power of both into the hands of the third in fact the whole power of the state was soon resolved into that body its due composition became therefore of infinitely the greater importance judge sir of my surprise when i found that a very great proportion of the assembly a majority i believe of the members who attended was composed of practitioners in the law it was composed not of distinguished magistrates who had given pledges to their country of their science prudence and integrity not of leading advocates the glory of the bar not of renowned professors in universities but for the far greater part as it must in such a number of the inferior unlearned mechanical merely instrumental members of the profession there were distinguished exceptions but the general composition was of obscure provincial advocates of stewards of petty local jurisdictions country attorneys notaries and the whole train of the ministers of municipal litigation the fomenters and conductors of the petty war of village vexation from the moment i read the list i saw distinctly and very nearly as it has happened all that was to follow the degree of estimation in which any profession is held becomes the standard of the estimation in which the professors hold themselves whatever the personal merits of many individual lawyers might have been and in many it was undoubtedly very considerable in that military kingdom no part of the profession had been much regarded except the highest of all who often united to their professional offices great family splendor and were invested with great power and authority these certainly were highly respected and even with no small degree of awe the next rank was not much esteemed 
the mechanical part was in a very low degree of repute whenever the supreme authority is vested in a body so composed it must evidently produce the consequences of supreme authority placed in the hands of men not taught habitually to respect themselves who had no previous fortune in character at stake who could not be expected to bear with moderation or to conduct with discretion a power which they themselves more than any others must be surprised to find in their hands who could flatter himself that these men suddenly and as it were by enchantment snatched from the humblest rank of subordination would not be intoxicated with their unprepared greatness who could conceive that men who are habitually meddling daring subtle active of litigious dispositions and unquiet minds would easily fall back into their old condition of obscure contention and laborious low and unprofitable chicane who could doubt but that at any expense to the state of which they understood nothing they must pursue their private interests which they understood but too well it was not an event depending on chance or contingency it was inevitable it was necessary it was planted in the nature of things they must join if their capacity did not permit them to lead in any project which could procure to them a litigious constitution which could lay open to them those innumerable lucrative jobs which follow in the train of all great convulsions and revolutions in the state and particularly in all great and violent permutations of property was it to be expected that they would attend to the stability of property whose existence had always depended upon whatever rendered property questionable ambiguous and insecure their objects would be enlarged with their elevation but their disposition and habits and mode of accomplishing their designs must remain the same well but these men were to be tempered and restrained by other descriptions of more sober minds and more enlarged understandings were they then to be awed by the super-eminent authority and awful dignity of a handful of country clowns who have seats in that assembly some of whom are said not to be able to read and write and by not a greater number of traders who though somewhat more instructed and more conspicuous in their order of society had never known anything beyond their counting-house no both these descriptions were more formed to be overborne and swayed by the intrigues and artifices of lawyers than to become their counterpoise with such a dangerous disproportion the whole must needs be governed by them to the faculty of law was joined a pretty considerable proportion of the faculty of medicine this faculty had not any more than that of the law possessed in france its just estimation its professors therefore must have the qualities of men not habituated to sentiments of dignity but supposing they had ranked as they ought to do and as with us they do actually the sides of sick-beds are not the academies for forming statesmen and legislators then came the dealers in stocks and funds who must be eager at any expense to change their ideal paper wealth for the more solid substance of land to these were joined men of other descriptions from whom as little knowledge of or attention to the interests of a great state was to be expected and as little regard to the stability of any institution men formed to be instruments not controls such in general was the composition of the tiers etat in the national assembly in which was scarcely to be perceived the slightest traces of what we call the natural landed interest of the country End of section four.